I'm not here today to convince you that the Shroud of Turin has to be the burial garment of Jesus or something like that. I'm interested in something a little more fundamental, and that's this. Dozens and dozens of pathologists and other authorities have checked this cloth, and, and basically I think we can agree to this. The conclusion is, if this cloth is not Jesus, at the very least, this is the closest you'll ever come to uh, crucifixion. This is the closest you'll ever see. And so therefore, it's useful to try to learn what crucifixion is and what Jesus went through. Now, I've been doing these slides um, for 20 years, done them hundreds of times. Well, now that people have seen the passion, they're sort of up to speed on some of this because the, the passion is accurate, especially the whipping portion. Actually, if I was to comment on the passion, most of my work is on the death and resurrection of Jesus. Most of the books out there on the table are on the resurrection. That's my, my first love. And when people ask me about the passion, my kind of one-liner comment is, the whipping of Jesus and the passion is accurate. The cross is actually rougher than the way Mel Gibson portrays it, if you can imagine that. The, the whipping is, is right on. But, the, but as you'll see a little bit today, it's, it was a little bit rougher on the cross than just putting somebody up there and having the person be worn out and die. So whether this is the burial garment of Jesus or not is not the issue. The question is, what is death by crucifixion? And there is obviously an aside here, could this possibly be his burial garment? I'm gonna go ahead and start with the slides right away. The shroud has been on display several times now. And if you were one of the millions of people who went to Turin, Italy, you might have stood in line for up to eight hours to see a picture like this one here. And you might think, I've been robbed. I've stood for eight hours, and I'm looking at one of those Worsatch tests in psychology. I mean, <laughs> seriously, I mean, how do you connect these dots? What is this? And this is supposed to be a man? And he's crucified? So, you know, you waited there for eight hours, and you got your camera. And this, whatever it is, this is the most examined archaeological artifact on the face of the earth. More research hours have been put in on this than any other artifact. And so, you know, you're there, and you take some pictures. And you get home, and you get your film developed, and you got this image in your mind of this, this uh, kind of wispy figure here, and you develop your film, and here's what you see. You say, well, that's not what I saw when I was standing there in line. But that's what your film says. Actually, the image on the shroud is a quasi, it's a type of photographic negative. And your picture is actually the positive. And this is the image of a man who's lying on his back. His hands are crossed. He's been mutilated in a hundred different ways, as we'll see here in detail. But the, the shroud is, was caught in a fire, actually, in the 16th century. It was just caught in a fire recently. So you have to get used to seeing those burn marks. The shroud was folded up like a bedspread. And when the molten silver came through the uh, cedar chest type deal it was in, um, it burned through the cloth. So what's going to happen here is I'm going to contrast on your left is the shroud as it appears to the naked eye. On your right is your photograph when you get home. Here's the face. On your right, what you would have seen when you stood in line. On the left, what your, what your camera says. And notice that there's a right-left reversal, and notice there's a light-darkness reversal. Some funny things are going on when you photograph this. For example, look at that three, number three-shaped blood stain on the forehead of the man in the shroud on the right. Notice the number three-shaped blood stain. You go home and you develop your pictures and look over on the left, it's backwards. The number three is backwards. And the dark spots on the shroud image, the bridge of the nose, the mustache, the beard, and so on, are now light on the left. So there's a, there's a left-right reversal, there's a lightness, light-darkness reversal, and right away, I mean, that doesn't make this a miraculous object, but it makes it a rather strange uh, object of, of study. Well, how long has this been around? That, this question is probably the one I get more than any other question. 
This is a 16th century painting, and it's pretty accurate. This shows you how the man in the shroud is buried, and you can see the ladies there weeping in the background and up above. Angels are holding the cloth open, and you see that image. There's a double head-to-head -head image of the man in the cloth. The cloth is wrapped lengthwise around his body from head to foot, and therefore, since it was wrapped as you see in the bottom there, when the cloth was opened, you have a frontal image and a back image. And if you've been keeping up with the uh, information just a few months ago, they discovered that there's a, a lighter image underneath on the inside of the cloth and another image out on top. There's a, there's a second image that goes, whatever this is, goes right through the cloth. And we're going to talk about some of these characteristics. First of all, let's talk about a little history. You saw the 16th century painting. I'm going to show you a few paintings of Jesus. And it is long thought that scientists down, uh, sorry, artists down through the centuries thought they were painting the face of Jesus. That doesn't prove anything, but it proves that they thought they were painting the face of Jesus. All right, take a look at that triangle mark between the eyes. Uh, that is not from the shroud, the little double wisp of hair. Notice the hair is parted down the middle, goes down both sides. And uh, the beard, the beard is double pointed. Notice on the left, notice the, the triangle between the eyes. Notice the hair comes down. Now notice the wrinkle going across the cloth on the left. It looks like the beard ends there. It looks like it's double pointed and it's off center. Notice the middle of that point, if that's what it is, is to the left of the nose. All right, look at the painting over here. Notice they've got a double point on the beard. The point is off center. They've got the triangle between the eyes, the little wisp of hair on the forehead. The eyes look abnormally large in the shroud. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So the artist makes the, the eyes abnormally large, long, slender nose, and it looks like the artist wants you to think he's copying the face of Jesus, and that's this. But actually, the beard goes down to the second line. You're going to see this a lot more clearly later. The beard goes down to the second line, and so what's the artist do? He puts a line going across Jesus' neck down below the beard. You see that? There's two lines underneath the beard because he doesn't know what those lines are. And so this, he, he thinks he's painting Jesus and yet he's wrong about the beard, but he thinks he's being accurate. That's what's so interesting here. Same thing. Notice the line underneath the throat. They put a second line for the beard, but he cuts the beard off up above. The long, thin nose, the large eyes, that triangle between the eyes, that's a wound or a mark on the cloth. The same two little wispy marks of hair on the forehead. The hair is split down the middle, going down each side. They think they're painting the face of Jesus. Doesn't mean they are, but down through history, this is the most copied image. Notice, if you just start going down yourself over the checklist, you see the hair parted down the middle, the triangle shape between the eyes, the very large, abnormally large eyes. He's got that double-pointed beard. Uh, Notice he's got bruises on the cheeks, because when you go back to Jesus, uh, what, they, what he thought was Jesus in the cloth, he's got bruises under his eyes. So he puts bruises on a living Jesus, a pre-beating Jesus. So they definitely think they're painting the face of Jesus here. Before I go to this slide, uh, let me just tell you that there are two little Roman coins from just before and just after 700. And these coins are the first coins we know of with the face of Jesus on the coin. And around the Roman coin, it says, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. A friend of mine just purchased an actual, I mean, they're rare, but purchased an actual coin. And these two faces, faces on two coins, are copied off the shroud face. How do you know that? Because if you have two pictures of somebody, let's say we've got your high school photo and somebody who looks like you just robbed a 7-Eleven. So they take a photo from inside the store. The nearest photo they have is your high school photo. They have to have X amount of points of similarity to say this is the same person. I've been told they need about 40 connection points. Between the face on the shroud and the faces on these two coins, there's between 70 and 200 connection points. There are paintings in Ravenna, Italy, and in St. Catherine's Monastery on the Sinai Peninsula that look the same way, look very much like they're copied off the shroud face. So it looks like somebody from history thinks they're painting the face of Jesus. Now in 1978, my co-author in a couple shroud books, uh, most of the photos you're gonna see are from the 1978 scientific investigation. 
circle obviously is put here around the right eye of the man in the shroud. Through image enhancement, a number of the scientists believe they can read what's under these eyes. Now let me first show you a leptin, uh, a coin from the first century. You see that staff in the middle and some Greek lettering around the edge. On your left is another leptin, and it's a little bit off the slide, but down there in the corner is a little guide what you can look for. But look up on your right hand, that's the right hand side is the man in the uh, shroud's eye, and look around the edge. See up at the top, U-C-A-I, you see those letters? U-C-A-I, and there's some other little squiggly marks on both sides. They are now up to seven letters. These are, you can see four right there. But U-C-A-I, you know what that is? That is part of the spelling of Tiberius Caesar's name. Tiberius Caesar, the man under the cloth in the shroud has two coins, which you'll be able to see later. Uh, two coins placed over his eyes, apparently. And this is the lettering from one of the coins. And that is the name Tiberius Caesar. And you know what you're looking at? What kind of coin this is? This is a leptin of Pontius Pilate. Thank you. We were looking for one of those earlier. Appreciate that. There's the U, C, A, I. This is a leptin of Pontius Pilate minted between 29 and 32 AD. Now how would somebody in the Middle Ages, if they faked the cloth, how would they know a, a coin of Pontius Pilate if they saw it? How would you know it? And this is a leptin with Tiberius Caesar's name, but, le but watch, this letter right here, it's misspelled. That should be a K instead of a C. Tiberius Caesar's name's misspelled. Do you know what they found seven other leptons of Pontius Pilate now with the same misspelling, with U-C-A-I? All right, I'm not here to solve mysteries. I'm just telling you some of the mysteries. <laughs> this photo is, for me, is kind of synonymous with why people are interested in the shroud today. This is the group of scientists gathering in the cathedral in Turin, Italy, 1978. Seated on the chair there is probably the chief shroud researcher, John Jackson, He's a theoretical physicist. Actually, he taught right here in uh, your state. He taught at uh, Colorado State University, I believe, physics department. He's seated there in front of a table that was constructed for, to, to spread this cloth out. You'll be able to see that. He's surrounded by the men and women who are going to do tests over the next several days. They're going to take several thousand photographs. This is John Jackson, same person you, you saw before. This is Eric Jumper. You can see that on his name tag there. He, they were professors at this time. They were both professors at the Air Force Academy, as were uh, my co-author, Ken Stevenson, and another guy, D. German, who was an agnostic, uh, who you can see in the previous picture. The four of them were in a famous carpool right in, right in Colorado Springs. They were in a carpool, and that's where the idea for testing the shroud started in the mid-1970s right here in your state. This is um, one of the chief photographers uh, for the team. He's a professor at the Brooks Institute of, of Photography, and um, he's off out of my range here, but this is an Italian scientist over on the side. For the first time, they are separating the front of the cloth from the back of the cloth, and they want to ask the, the question, is the shroud image, does it go all the way through the cloth, or is it on the front only? Because those conclusions are very important, and we'll give you the answer with a slide a little bit later. You can tell this is the 70s, folks, right? This is a physicist from the Jet Propulsion Lab with his flower power shirt on. This is Sam Pellicori, who's a, a, um, an agnostic, and he's examining the face area of the man in the shroud. The shroud is uh, it's not on that, it's, uh, stretched out on the table. His hands are crossed in front of him, so you can see the, the feet are going to be down here, and the, and the, and the uh, top of the head's going to be here. And he's doing some microscopic work in the face area. Like I said, these are actual photos from the scientific investigation. Kodak made some sticky tape so that they could take samples off the cloth. Here, they're taking samples off the feet. And the man in the shroud has dirt and blood on the bottom of his feet. Let me tell you something interesting about the, the dirt. The dirt, this has been written up in a peer-reviewed secular chemical journal. The, the uh, dirt on the bottom of his feet is limestone, which is found almost exclusively in Palestine. The uh, shroud is set up here on the uh, table. They're taking thousands of photographs. This looks like it'd be, 
be infrared or something like that. Uh, this is actually ultraviolet photographs being taken. Some more of the same. Here's the digital readout at the bottom where they're interested in the data that comes out, not on the fuzziness. By the way, you can see a little bit more here how the shroud goes down to how the uh, beard goes down to here. It doesn't stop right there. All right, this and the next photo are image enhanced. This is not the regular color of the shroud image. And these two photos, everything the same density as blood shows up red. So they've done some scanning on the cloth. And in the, the West, we have a far too dainty view of crucifixion, at least up until the Passion came out. But this man in the shroud has been beaten very, very severely. Uh, he's swollen under both of his eyes. He's got large contusions. His eyes are basically swollen almost shut. Um, you can see that, that triangle-shaped mark right here. Here's at number three, blood stain. This is a very ancient wrinkle because the blood is flowing along that wrinkle. The beard actually goes down here. He's got blood throughout his beard, throughout his mustache. It's believed by some of the medical community who studied this. Dozens of pathologists, medical doctors have studied this. Some of them think that one of the blows to his face ripped his, his uh, lip up to his nose. And so th this man has, has been very seriously beaten. This is also enhanced photo. It's not the normal color. But all these little squiggly marks, you're going to see them much more clearly later. This man has over 200 whipping marks on his body. Over 200 whipping marks. This is the, a wound in the side. These are patches that were sold on, sewed on by nuns after the first fire. The hands come down. They're crossed. You can see that there's a print right here where presumably a nail has gone in, the bleeding in the back of his hand. You can't see the, the hole on the right hand. It's covered up. But there's a double blood flow up each wrist. But these are enhanced photos. And again, you're going to be able to see very clearly in a later photo how much carnage has been done on this person by the whipping. This is a photo micrograph. If my co-author in the Shroud book, Ken Stevenson, the former Air Force Academy professor, if he were here, he would tell you that the photo micrographs are his favorite photos. This is a close-up of the weave on the cloth. It's, it's a three-to-one linen weave. And to answer that earlier question, are, is there a stain on the back? The blood stains go all the way through, but these silvery image threads do not go through. In fact, they don't even go through a single thread. This is a thread made, of, made up of perhaps 200 individual fibrils. The shroud image is only one or two fibrils deep. It does not go into the cloth, which is incredible, because in physical terms, there's no paint, dye, powder, or any foreign substance on the cloth that can account for the image. It's a superficial image. You say, well, didn't you tell us there was an image on the other side of the cloth? There is, and it's also superficial. There's an image on both sides of the cloth, but nothing in between. And it's very, very difficult to explain in terms of modern science. In fact, there's only one more thing that's more difficult to explain than superficiality, and that's this. At the Air Force Academy in the mid-'70s, they took photographs of the shroud, and they placed them in a computer known as a VP8 image analyzer. There's only one working one in the world today, as far as I know. Uh, the man who owns it is a former scientist who was on this team. And when you put photos from Earth, uh, th th this was made for photos from space, Voyager space shots and so on. But if you put uh, photos from Earth into this VP8 image analyzer, everything becomes distorted. The, the nose sinks into the face, the eyes bug out. It does not look like a normal human face. But when they put the photo of the shroud in there, this is what they saw looking at them. And the face was was symmetrical and unlike anything else. Now, let me, let me tell you what this means. The man buried in the shroud has his hands crossed in front of him, and his head is bent forward like this. He's in a state of rigor mortis, and his body is starting to return to the pre-death state. His left leg is popped up like this, so the knee is up in the air. And the cloth, you can imagine, would drape over the high points of the body. That's why it looks like the eyes are large. The nose, the, the cloth would drape over the forehead and the chin, but it wouldn't be on the ears. It would be on the chest, but not on the throat. The hands are crossed like this, so the cloth is going to drape primarily over the left hand. The left leg is raised, so the cloth is going to be over the left leg and not as clearly over the, the right knee. And yet, when you see the image, they are all equally clear. 
It doesn't make any difference if the cloth is sitting right on it or if the cloth is over top of it. Whatever's created the image on the cloth traveled across space to make that image on the cloth. And so the 3D image, I've got a couple other pictures. The 3D image, there's a side view of it. The 3D image gives you a cloth to body distance. That tells you how far the cloth was from the body, but also tells you that whatever made the image leaped through space. And the last one here is turned sideways, so you're gonna have to imagine what that looks like, but so I'll return to this one. Um, and whatever created the shroud image, this is the most difficult thing to, quote, fake from the shroud. Now, I told you the cloth was wrapped this way around a body, so when you open the cloth, what would you folks expect? This man is about 5'10", 180 pounds. He's in good physical shape, as you'll see in a couple later photos. But he's got 180 pounds lying on this cloth. Do you think the back image would be darker? Or the, do you think the top image would be darker, which simply is laid on top of his body? The back image would be darker, right? No. But neither is the top. Both images are equal. The image on the shroud is independent of, of body weight. It's independent of what touched the body. Whatever it is went through the cloth and left an image. All right, if you're familiar, how many of you have seen The Passion? Last time I gave this lecture for stealing the mind, I couldn't ask that question. This, this is a, an artist's uh, reconstruction of a flagrum. One has actually been discovered in Pompeii. And on the end, it seems like the man in the shroud, there's different ways, different kinds you can, uh, different things you can attach to the end. The man in the shroud was apparently beaten by an instrument like this with dumbbell shaped pieces of lead affixed to the rawhide. They even believe, scientists believe, that the edge of the lead was sharpened so that on contact it was designed to gouge human flesh and it would rip through anything. It would not just rip through skin and through muscle, but it would tear, um, I, mean, I mean, really anything. It, it, would, it would rip nerves. And so you can imagine the incredible amount of pain. This is just an artist's drawing on the, on the right. But on the left, this is a close-up of, of the back wounds of the man in the shroud. And this is his back. Of course, it's, it's large. You're going to be better off look at the side ones over there because that's more to scale and you can see how much damage has been done as I said by best estimates this man has 220 whipping marks on his body I say by best estimates because I have to do some estimating where the burn marks have gone through so they they try to say they look at this area and, and give it about the same kind of rating this blood across the waist is actually from the chest wound the right chest wound that flowed down the chest and then around the back, presumably when the body was laid down and buried. But that's the, the chest wound with the uh, blood and water, both of which are, are uh, visible there, growing across the waist. Here's the, the four wounds most regularly associated with, with crucifixion. And it seems that the man in the shroud, this is from the shroud, you could do this a lot of different ways, had his foot crossed over the other one with a single nail holding both, and it seems that the nails are in the wrist. When you say, well, doesn't the Bible say Jesus was nailed to the hands? Actually, the Bible doesn't say that. In the crucifixion accounts, all it says is, and they crucified him. The only time we know about the nail prints is from the resurrection accounts and he shows them his hands and his feet. You say, well, okay, fine. Wasn't he nailed to the hands? Virtually every, I know one exception of the dozens of medical doctors who've looked at this, they've said the man in the shroud is nailed to the wrist. You say, well, so much the worse for the shroud. Actually, these medical doctors believe that all crucifixion victims had to be nailed to the wrist because in normal circumstances, a nail placed through the palm would rip out whereas one placed here would easily hold an adult male. And you say, well, okay, but still, you're missing the point. Doesn't the New Testament say he was nailed to the hands? All right, maybe you've heard your pastor say that many times Greek is more accurate than English, four words for love and so on, but this is the opposite. 
The Greek word for hand is not a very exact word. In fact, there's no Greek word for wrist. And so everything you see sticking beyond my shirt sleeve is called hand in the Greek. In fact, one time in the Greek Old Testament, the word is used and it's the upper arm. So it's, it's not a very accurate word. It means an appendage. And so to, say, to use that word does not tell you where it, uh, it's been nailed. And by far, most New Testament scholars and medical doctors believe the nails were placed right here in the wrist, right about where, where you see that in the, uh, in the drawing. This, this picture's flipped around. You know, it depends on whether you're talking about the original or your photograph as to whether it's left or right. But in this shroud, that's the left hand you're looking at. Let me tell you something very, very strange about this painting. I mean painting, that's a, that was a snafu. Um, this photograph. Notice how abnormally long the fingers look. It looks like this is way, way longer than fingers would normally be. Years ago, critics said, they said, uh, look at that. It's, it just doesn't, it doesn't look, uh, doesn't look human. You know what you're looking at? The latest theory on the composition of the image is that it was caused by a couple of different kinds of radiation. This looks like it's going all the way through the hand. You're looking at the knuckles here. You're looking at the back of the hand and you're seeing the finger bones back in the hand, which makes it much longer. And a little bit later, I, I want to show you a picture, that, uh, a slide that's even more incredible, but just keep this one in mind. Uh, what you're actually looking at here is something that's more like an x-ray. You say, well, I mean, how scientific is that? The last time I was at a Shroud conference, the two men who were speaking most about x-rays, one of them, a retired medical doctor from Duke Medical School, the other one, the head of, head of radiology, UCLA. So we're not talking about some, you know, fly-by-night kind of, of view here. Here's an artist's conception of where the spear went in the side. If, uh, if this is accurate, I mean, for the man in the shroud, it's accurate, but if this is typical of what they did, the spear most likely entered between the fifth and the sixth rib through the right pleural cavity and into the heart. Around the heart, there's a sac. It's called the pericardium, and it holds a thin, watery substance. And so when we're told that when they withdrew the spear, when the Roman soldier withdrew the spear, blood and water came out, by far the most likely explanation, according to medical doctors, is that the blood came from the heart and the water came from the pericardial sac that surrounds the heart. And on the shroud, there's about a half dozen evidences that this man is dead. We talked about one earlier. Uh, he's in a state of rigor mortis. Here's another one because the, the chest wound shows not only blood, but a watery serum that's even more visible on the back where it flowed across the waist. Now, I usually, when I get here to, down toward the end here, I have a checklist to see if I've, I've uh, covered things. This one might be kind of hard for you to see, but my second slide was a close-up of this. Besides the x-ray looking fingers, up underneath the chin, right there, I was showing these slides with a medical doctor uh, a couple times I had doctors in the front row, and one of them said, hey, go back to that slide. I said, I want to see something. And you can see, I, I'm not, I didn't discover this. I mean, this is out there. This is in the literature. But, you know, what, what scientists thought was chapped lips, that the lips were a little bit chapped. Underneath the lips, you could see these marks. You know what they are? Teeth and roots. You can see the teeth and the roots going down into the, into the chin. Whatever created this image not only went, appears to have gone through the hand to come out onto the cloth to get this part back in here, but also coming up through the body, leaving the teeth imprinted on the cloth inside out, the roots and the teeth. The medical doctor from Duke, the retired medical doctor said 23 teeth are, are visible through the lips. Now, this is pretty incredible. And when you throw in here that this shroud has been, now I'll, I'll give you the big knock on it. 
The shroud was dated, carbon dated 1988 to be medieval. Uh, a lot of you mis mistrust carbon dating for a lot of reasons. But I'll also tell you that there was a private dating in the shroud that didn't make the press. It was dated in 1982. And you know what the two dates were in 1982? 30 AD plus or minus, 70 AD plus or minus. So we're not talking, you know, faith versus science. If you say, oh no, this has got to be Jesus, but you've got a medieval date here. How about just doing the, the dating alone? You've got a medieval date, and the medieval date was not taken from the image area. It was taken from the, the most contaminated side area of the shroud. And now the most popular theory is what they actually dated in 1988 was a medieval sew-in patch. The 1982 dating was taken from threads from the image area. And it came out to 30 and 70 AD, plus or minus. Folks, I'm not here today to tell you that the uh, Shroud of Turin has to be the burial garment of Jesus. I'm not telling you that it's, it's got to be. You know, it may be, may not be. I know one time I was uh, giving a lecture on a university campus, and a young lady came up to me, and she said, she said, the problem with Christians is that we take Jesus' death too much for granted, and especially his suffering. Now, it's hard to do that after the passion. But she said, we take his suffering too much for granted. She said, we Christians say, Jesus died for my sins, and our next sentence is just as likely to be, let's go get a hamburger. Her point is not that we should sit and talk about the gore, but that we should just do a little more contemplation, a little more meditation, a little more thought on what his death meant. I made the comment earlier that if anything, uh, uh, Gibson, Mel Gibson's movie was accurate on the whipping. I heard the shroud was one of the things he used. I, I knew when they, were, when they were beating Jesus, I knew that he was going to, they had to get him to turn over on his back, and the whipping was... You know, having studied this all my life for 25 years, um, I don't mean the shroud, I mean the death and resurrection of Jesus for 25 years, you're not, that's not a buffer, you know, for just taking something like the passion for granted. But they whipped his back, as you saw, and the man in the shroud, the man in the shroud is whipped, I told you over 200 times, 200 marks, he's whipped on every inch of his body, with the exception of his face, which was severely beaten, with the exception of his face, right here in his forearms, and his feet. Everything else is whipped with the flagrum. But on the calves of the man in the shroud, the calves are whipped. And pathologists who study the cloth are so careful and able to tell so much from this cloth, they can tell that at least two men did the whipping. One was significantly taller than the other one, and one of them was left-handed. That's how much they can tell from the pathology. I mean, you know, you, just don't, you know CSI and the old Quincy program and how if you're gonna kill somebody, don't leave a fingernail around because they'll track it to you and things like that. Uh, science is pretty specific today. And they can take this cloth and find out a lot about what's happening. But I made the comment that while the whipping was accurate and I knew he was gonna have to roll over something and get his chest because the man in the shroud is whipped all over his body, the cross is actually much worse than the movie said because according to most medical doctors, it's not unanimous, but according to most medical doctors, death by crucifixion is basically death by asphyxiation. And when you hang in the down position on the cross, the weight of your body pulls down, and what I'm going to describe to you can happen on the monkey bars if you can hang on long enough. But in one uh, German experiment, there's a couple medical doctors, if you could believe this, medical doctors who've asked for male volunteers to be crucified. Now, they're going to be real nice to you because in the one experiment, they use seat belts for the wrists, not nails. <laughs> it's like, Doc, I came in here for the flu. I didn't really be, expect to be nailed to a... And they use cups to inserts for the feet. And in one experiment in Cologne, Germany, the men were simply tied to two-by-fours. They were simply tied to two-by-fours. They passed out. They passed out in a maximum of 12 minutes. In 12 minutes, they were unconscious. You think, well, how does that happen? I mean, Pilate was surprised Jesus died after six hours because in the German experiment, their feet were not affixed to anything. They were hanging. 
But if your feet are nailed or tied, what you can do is you push up on those nails, you pull up on these nails, and you worm your body into a different position. This, is, this was the most common one in experiments. It's hard to even, I, if I do this, I can't even talk. Things happen to your lungs when you do that. And with the weight of your body, pulling down on those muscles, the same muscles you exercise, the intercostal, deltoid, and pectoral muscles, with the weight of your body pulling down, they constrict on your lungs. And you can breathe as long as you can push up and stay up. But the weight of your body is on those nails. It's horrific pain. Gravity pulls you down. And you slump back into this position again. The minute you slump down into that position, you begin asphyxiating. And if the West German ex uh, experiment is accurate, it could, you could be unconscious in 12 minutes, 15 minutes, and it could be over in a half hour if you, can't, if you can't pull yourself back up. Now, all of you know, I don't care what kind of shape you're in, if your life depends on you being able to do pull-ups, nobody in this room is going to live for very long. And that's the nature of death by crucifixion. You push up with your legs and pull up with your hands. And so when they smash your ankles, now you put two and two together, they smash your ankles and you're reduced to having to do a pull-up to live. And that's why once they smash your ankles, it's not just something they did to be nasty. I mean, the whole process is to be nasty. But they smash your ankles for a very specific purpose. If you can't pull back up again, you asphyxiate and it's over quickly. And so on the cross, in the Passion, Jesus would have been hanging down in the low position, and if all of this is accurate, he'd have been asphyxiating, pushing up, and every time he pushes up, he would explode and breathe in again, much like a diver who goes off a board. You know that feeling, you didn't get enough air for how deep you ended up going, and you just weren't sure you were going to make it up to the surface and be able to breathe again, you know? Maybe you felt like Fred Sanford, you know? This is it, I'm coming, Elizabeth. And, and you thought it was all over. And you know how you explode out of the top of that water when you don't have enough air? <sighs> how would you like to do that every minute or two on the cross and do it for six hours and be asphyxiating for six hours. That's the nature of death by crucifixion. So take the beating from the passion and link it with this kind of explosion kind of breathing where you have to get a breath every couple minutes and stay up as long as you can. If you're going to talk, you talk from the up position. By the way, the closer they nail your hands to your head, the faster you're going to die. The further they put them out, they stretch it out. Now, these guys weren't medical doctors, but they didn't have to have stethoscopes and EEGs and everything else because you don't fake death by crucifixion. If you're hanging in the low position for any amount of time and you're not pushing up, that means you're at least unconscious and close to death. You can't stay in the low position and just hope nobody sees you hanging there. You say, I'm trying, going to try to control my rapid eye movements and hope they think I'm dead. Well, the joke's on you because they're going to leave you an hour or two you know, in that position, and you're not going to live. It's like holding your breath for two hours underwater. And so if you add that to the passion, you'll see how much worse this really gets. Well, folks, what we're looking at here, this, what you've seen, this may or may not be the burial garment of Jesus. I'm not here today to tell you it is. But if this is the burial garment of Jesus, if it is, this would be the most incredible artifact on the face of the earth. At least I think so. We have a lot of people here with a lot of artifacts out here, so we could, we could, have, we could have an argument about whether this... I'll tell you what. If the shroud is authentic and the ark is authentic, I'll take the shroud over ten arcs. Now I'll make some people upset out there. What we need is a debate. That's good. Um, <laughs> because you know why? If the shroud is authentic, what you have in that picture is the gospel. The gospel's right there. Because the man buried in the cloth is dead. He's in a state of rigor mortis. He's got post-mortem blood flow. He's got separation of blood and serum. About six reasons to believe he's dead. The man buried in the cloth is dead. And now you have to answer the question, what caused the image on the cloth? If that's radiation coming from a dead body, this gets pretty exciting. 
and the image is on the bottom side of the cloth and the image is on the front side of the cloth. It's almost like it made a little burn. You know what the image is made of? I can tell you scientifically, I can tell you the words. The image is made, the image of, is made of conjugated dehydrated cellulose. You say, great, I really need that. But you know what that means? That means the shroud image appears to be a scorch on a piece of linen, as if you left an iron a little too long on a white shirt. That's conjugated dehydrated cellulose. The image looks like it's burnt out of the cloth. It may not be the burial garment of Jesus. There may still be a scientific explanation for it somewhere. But it's possible, that's all I'm saying, it's possible that this is the death of Jesus. And it's possible that what you're seeing here is the result of the resurrection. The man in the cloth is dead. And we all know dead men don't do much. But there's an image on the underside and on the top of the cloth this is not a normal man. Something is happening to this man. And some have even said, I try to avoid bombastic sorts of things, so I'm really kind of trying to play this down. But some have even said that the shroud image is a photograph of the resurrection of Jesus. It is a photograph. We started with that. The shroud image is a photograph. And it may be a photograph of the resurrection of Jesus. Could be. Maybe it's not. But here's the follow-up point. Let's say it's not. Even if it's not Jesus, medical doctors say it is very, very accurate. At the very least, it's the closest picture we have, closer than the passion. This is the real thing. Somebody was crucified. Whatever the shroud is, it at least is the shroud of a man who was crucified. And so therefore, we learn a lot about crucifixion. If it's not Jesus, we still learn what Jesus went through. And most of my things on the table out there are about the resurrection. I've 50 percent of all the books I've written of the 26 books, 11 of my books are on the resurrection. I specialize in the resurrection of Jesus. I'll tell you folks, with all the evidence from the shroud, the evidence for the resurrection is stronger. The historical evidence for the resurrection is stronger than the shroud data. We have more evidence for the resurrection than you need to show it occurred. Some exciting things are happening today. Have a good afternoon.